Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Wednesday webinars with the Utah Center for Legal Inclusion, or UCLE. Um, today, we're really excited to welcome two panelists today um, who are going to talk about the idea of um, you know, maintaining well-being and, and all of that, but avoiding burnout while staying actively engaged in your profession. And they're also going to share insights about how they came to be lawyers and, and what they do as lawyers and all of those things that we often cover in these webinars. So we're excited to jump in today. Um, we have with us today um, Amber Stargill, who I just now I just had to pause. I was just asking her how to pronounce her name and then I panicked, but I was going to do it wrong. Uh, Amber Stargill, who is softy. softy. And, and that was the exact thought I had. Softy. Uh, so Amber Stargill, who's an associate at Christensen and Jensen, a, a Salt Lake City law firm. And then we have Shade Turner, who is a shareholder at Strong and Hanny, another Salt Lake law firm. Um, as is our tradition on Wednesday webinars, rather than having me um, read a bio of these presenters, I like to have them introduce themselves and um, not only introduce you know, who they are, but give a little bit of background and specifically answer why, why it is that they came to be lawyers in the first place. And so, um, Maybe let's start with Amber and then we can go to Shade. Hi everyone, my name is Amber Stargell. I am originally from Cleveland, Ohio. I'm sorry if I have a list too, by the way, I'm wearing retainers, but um, <laughs> yeah, I just got them put in or aligners, I should say. Um, but I am originally from Cleveland, Ohio. I originally went to law school at Texas Southern University, Thurgood Marshall School of Law. I transferred to University of Utah um, S.J. Quinney School of Law while, um, or College of Law when I came here to intern my 1L summer. So I'm sure we will get into that further on down the line. So I'm not gonna waste too much of my introduction talking about that. Um, so um, I recently graduated in May, 2020. So I'm a COVID grad and um, being an attorney has been an adventure for me because I didn't have the traditional route most attorneys have had by taking the bar. We actually got to do the 360 um, hour credit and um, that's how we, that's how I obtained my license. So it was a different um, route and a different way of me transitioning from being a student into being an attorney. And um, now I work at Christensen and Jensen um, downtown and I do everything from criminal litigation to family law to civil litigation to both sides of civil litigation, whether it be insurance defense or sometimes plaintiff's work as well. Um, it just depends. We have a number of shareholders and partners who have caseloads across the line. So it's whatever a partner who sees me in a hallway walking to my office decides to give me that day, I'm doing. And um, I absolutely love it. I um, mainly love my law firm because I love the people. And that's one of the reasons why I chose to stay. And uh, I would be happy to get more into detail about what exactly I do and what it's like being a first year associate um, once we um, get into questions. So that's me. Perfect. Before we go to Sade, let me just um, ask one clarification context question. Can you just explain what insurance defense entails or what that means? Uh insurance defense so um if you get into a car accident is the easiest way i could put it if you get into a car accident and um someone hits you and now your insurance company needs to um pay the insurance defense of that or um there's you know discussion about your personal injuries and the insurance company has to pay those injuries we have to represent the insurance companies um we represent the insurance companies um, on behalf of whoever the defendant is in that case. Um, so that's insurance defense, whereas the plaintiff side of that is you're injured by someone, someone hits you and you want your money. So we want to go to the insurance company. We're going to the insurance company saying you owe us, you owe my client. Like your client messed my client up and so you should pay us. <laughs> and that's what we... Those are like kind of both sides of the civil V. And then criminal defense is what you see on Law and Order or any nighttime TV. 
That's a, a great, uh, excellent. <laughs> I think it a could lot probably of- be a little more detailed, but that's just the best way I could put it <laughs> outside of like legal jargon. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I think a lot of young attorneys in Salt Lake start out doing insurance defense. And so it's, it's a good thing to have a, some context for at least. Um, okay, Shade, go ahead and introduce yourself. Okay, my name is Shade Turner. I'm originally from a really small town in southeastern Washington called Prescott, uh, where there were 300 people. And I was the only person who was African American in my town. So uh, that was an interesting thing for a lot of different reasons. And we may get into that a little bit later. After I graduated from high school, I graduated a little early. When I was 17, I went to college in southern Idaho at College of Idaho. It's located near Boise, a small private liberal arts school, but the school itself had 800 people. So, I mean, it was almost three times as big as the place where I grew up. <laughs> and then from there, I, I always knew I wanted to go to law school. When I say always, I mean, from the time I was a little kid. Um, and people will say that about, I've noticed that other lawyers will say that. And I am sure it's true just because I had that experience. I would, I was the eldest cousin and I would make my younger cousins play court and do all of these things that I'm sure they didn't want to do. So I knew that I, this was something I wanted to do and I applied um, to several different schools and was accepted at University of Utah, which is how I came to be in Utah. I originally wasn't planning on staying here. I worked summers in Idaho and I thought that I would move back there after I graduated. Um, life ended up having other plans for me, and I ended up at a small firm uh, for about nine months before coming to Strong and Hanny as a lateral hire associate. My areas of practice, I, I'm a trial attorney. I love going to trial. I have quite a few trials under my belt given um, my number of years of practice, which I'm entering now my 15th year of practice. Uh, but I focus on family law and insurance related matters. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I think I'm going to jump ahead to to one of the questions that I had later in the lineup, because um, you both hit on this and, and Shade, you just did in, in the last piece of your, your introduction. Um, neither of you are from Utah originally. So um, what type of considerations or factors um, came into play when you were making the decision to come to Utah for law school or to transfer in Amber's case? And what influenced your decision to stay here ultimately? Well, um, I I could go ahead and go first on this one. Um, What influenced me in terms of coming to Utah is I wanted a place that was safe. I wanted a place that had a good law school. And then as far as staying here, um, a legal community where I felt as though I was engaged, meaning that I was making connections. So when I was in law school, I did different things like ends of court and just anything that I could do to try to meet other lawyers because I am not from here and I also am not from a family of attorneys. I'm the first one. So I knew instinctively, I just needed to get out and meet people and uh, see how I felt about the community. And ultimately we have a great legal community in Utah. Um, It's small and you know, there, there are always things that are difficult in every profession, but I think that there's a lot of collegiality among our bar. And so that was a big factor for me in terms of wanting to stay in Utah. Great, thank you. Amber, do you have anything to add for your own personal experience? Uh, yes, because my experience, of course, as you stated, is different than Shade's. I transferred here, right, from um, Texas Southern University, which was which is an historically Black um, institution, and that it was it's located in Houston, Texas. And um, when I originally set out to apply to law school, um, I originally wanted to go to a more diverse city, larger city, um, a place that I'd never been, some place that was warm all year round. Um, I did not want to be back in the snow being from Cleveland, Ohio. Um, And I got to Texas Southern and I absolutely did love it. Like I still um, have my tides back in Houston. And um, I still go back every so often and I still very much love the school and love my professors who are still there and who have moved on. Um, However, my one year, I came to Salt Lake City 
via um, a pipeline program called DAP. And if any of you guys are out there and you're interested in um, going to law school, I would suggest you guys look into the DAP program. It's based out of Chicago. And it was started by two African-American female attorneys who were dedicated to, um, to bringing young other minority female law students who were in their first year of law school to um, intern at mid-sized to large law firms because they realized that there was this discrepancy and this basically gap of, you know, there are large law firms in this country who don't have any African-American people or African-American women in um, their law offices at all. Um, and then the ones that do, a lot of them don't have any either African-American um, partners or shareholders um, amongst them. So they were really dedicated to really broadening that and like putting other minority law students um, in positions where they could intern at these at these law firms. And I, um, through the process, got selected to go to Christensen and Jensen. And I got there. And originally for me, when I told when I was told I was going to Salt Lake City, I was like, okay, that's great. I'm willing to take on a new opportunity. Um, I am never one to say no to necessarily a challenge. If I fail, then that's just what it is. But I'm always willing to learn from either the experience or whatever the case is. So I was like, you know, I'm gonna go to Salt Lake City. My family didn't understand why. <laughs> they were very nervous and, and scared for me. Um, a lot of people, a lot of my family have it. They really have not been probably west of the Mississippi. So me being in Texas was already like a lot for them, but going to Salt Lake City, they're like, we don't understand at all. Um, so when I got here, I kind of had my own apprehensions. I was only going off of what I've heard um, via media or elsewhere. And I got here and I absolutely loved it. And to hit on what Sade had said, um, so when I was deciding about transferring, um, it came down to two things. One thing was finance. Um, and I think that that's really key is like finance for me, um, my family was sending me $200 a month my first year. And I knew that I had to like pull my weight at some point while I was in law school because it was becoming a, a strain. Like Shade, I am the first person in my family to go to law school. So um, my family just wanted to support me and make sure that I made it through. And so I had to make a decision my 2 year year um, about working, like if I was gonna work where I, where I would work, whether it be in retail or doing just something on the side to just pitch in and help my family. Um, so that was one. And the second thing was is that if I do transfer, I wanted to go to a community, a legal community that was smaller than Texas. So I was exposed enough to the um, legal community in Texas long enough to know it's really, really big. Um, it's a large bar. And even in Houston, you don't interact with the entire bar in Houston. You, you know, pick certain groups that you are interested in and that's who you interact with. And um, it, it can be overwhelming and especially as a minority female entering into this profession, um, you it's easy to get overlooked and kind of almost like overlook your own personal needs so you can kind of match whatever is going on in the market at that time. So I wanted to be in a smaller bar, something a little more um, that has more of a community as well. And um, from there, uh, when I when the partners came to me, they actually asked me if I was considering transferring and I was, it wasn't necessarily to the U at that point, but I was. And um, from there I had talked to Reyes Aguilar and we had a discussion and um, I was like, okay, I could, I could probably see myself actually living here. And I, I had been there a couple of, been here a couple of weeks to understand the community and to put in my application to the University of Utah. I didn't think I would get in. Um, and not to say I know that I'm a very fierce competitor, but the University of Utah is a very competitive law school. So I was like, eh, you know, it'd be great, but you know, I still have my thing in Houston too, if that works out. And I ended up coming here and it 
it actually has been a very great choice for me as far as my career goes. Um, as Shade said, we do have a great legal community, um, especially for minorities, um, because I'm able to have contact, like direct contact with people I would never have had um, ease of contact with in Texas, like federal judges. That's just not something that in Texas, if you don't know, if you don't know who to know in Texas, you're not just gonna get in and like hang out with a federal judge that just doesn't happen down there. <laughs> but um, so yeah, I mean, I think that uh, going into that one thing, since we are speaking to students for you to consider is, you know, what type of bar do you wanna be in? What type of legal community do you wanna be in? Um, and really look into the size of that community and um, what type of organizations they have within that bar. Um, really like research it because, you know, typically what happens is the law school that you go to typically ends up being the place where you end up staying after law school. Um, I do know people who go back to their home states and everything, but, um, basically that's what ends up happening. So just make sure you research and understand um, the state that you're going to and a bar that you're gonna be entering in as well. And that's all I have on that one. Yeah, that's great. That's a lot of good, good information in there. And we're gonna come back to some of that, but we do have a question already in the Q and A. And I do wanna know and encourage um, anyone, please keep the questions coming. We wanna keep this as interactive as possible. So. So um, I'm grateful that we have this question here. So um, I think you touched on this, Amber, already, and, and Shadi, both of you, but um, maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on, on this question that we have here. How did you build your network here? Like, it, I, I think it touches on the idea that, um, you know, you, you both were from out of state, but there was opportunities here, right? So how did, maybe specifically, how did you go about building the network of people around you? Uh, sure. So I had mentioned I participated in Ends of Court as a law student. So what Ends of Court is, is it's a monthly meeting and there are two different ends in Utah. Um, and I, there was an opportunity at the law school. Hey, what students want to participate in this? You're going to meet practitioners and judges, both state and federal judges. Um, would you like to do this? And I said, yes. And I ended up, what, what happens is you're given a problem per se, um, like a legal problem. And you, you meet every month, uh, socialize, and then you discuss it. And so I ended up doing a lot of the work um, for my specific small group, but I knew that was gonna be the case because I was the student and everybody else was you know, in private practice or government practice or on the bench and had less time. But that was worth it for me. And it was worth it for me because I was able to get my name out there and meet people who, as Amber said, you know, not that I wouldn't have had any access to, but it would have been more difficult. And certainly it provided um, an opportunity where there was something else we're all focusing on rather than just the direct, like getting to know somebody type of thing. There was that too, but it was, it was good in terms of we were all focusing on discussing the specific problem. It was, it was a free speech issue. Oh, and then there were some people who or ends of court that also have no, um, that are not directly involved in legal community. So Doug Fabrizio with NPR was a part of the end of court that year. Cool. And I know Shade, you're also in, um, involved in, you know, bar sections and, and things like that as well, right? Absolutely. So that was um, after law school largely, but during law school even, I took the opportunity that when volunteers were needed, for you know anything with litigation section or anything with Utah Minority Bar Association, I would volunteer um, because again, it was another point of contact for being able to meet people. Plus, it was just fun, you know. And so that's something we're going to get into is like the work-life balance and you know not getting burned out. I think it's important to uh, identify things that are fun um, because it is extremely taxing to be an attorney and to be in law school. But yes, I mean, I'm in, I'm involved now with the family law executive committee. I was on litigation section, uh, for many years. So I, I always have some type of an involvement with a bar organization. Okay. Thank you for that. Amber, what, what's your perspective as a new graduate on building a network? As a new graduate, um, I okay. So I guess I could start with being a student. Yeah, absolutely. Um, since um, I think I'm closer in relation to that. Um, 
So for being a student, um, especially a transfer student, I, um, it, was, it was difficult at first, I will say that for me, because I was not familiar with Utah at all. Um, but for me also, um, I was working for a law firm as well. I was a clerk and I was working part-time. And um, so going, being in the law school, I was still trying to fill it out my second year. So I was technically socially a year behind. And mm -hmm. some of you guys will realize once you get to law school, how your 1-0 year, you kind of build a lot of relationships. And when you transfer your 2-0 year, you come in and everyone already has these established relationships where now I'm trying to get in on people's study groups and things like that and try to build relationships that have already been established amongst my classmates. So my second year, I kind of took a step back socially um, in, in law school because um, when I had to figure out my, my study habits at the U and two, I was working as well. But um, because I was working at Christensen and Jensen, I already had attorneys who were similar to Sade, like volunteering and already out in the community who were willing to invite me to certain events or introduce me to certain people. Um, now my 3L year was when I started really doing more of that work myself. And um, one of my best friend, my 3L year was LinkedIn. <laughs> LinkedIn, um, if you, you know, don't have a LinkedIn page, I really suggest you get one. Make sure you have a really great headshot. Um, and really keep it um, professional and everything else on there because LinkedIn, as far as a networking place and a networking um, location goes, is was paramount for me. And um, from there, I had, um, when I had got uh, linked up with a reporter out of Washington, D.C., she was doing a, um, a report on law schools that had less than like 1% minorities or African-Americans in her law school. And somehow came like when she got to the University of Utah, like she somehow got our numbers and saw that there was only one African-American, not just in the class, but in like the entire school at the time. And <laughs> so she was like searching, trying to figure out who this one African-American person in Salt Lake City was, and she came across one of my classmates who she thought was African-American. And he was like, no, I actually know who you're talking about though. Like, her name is Amber Stargell. And so she looked me up on LinkedIn. And, um, and that's how we, that's how I was able to, you know, partake in that article, which linked me into um, becoming um, the Western Regional membership director for the Black Law Students um, Associations of Balsa. And um, so that opened up an opportunity for me. Um, also through LinkedIn, I started reaching out to judges or other attorneys that I would see either who would come to the school or I would see um, either um, in the courthouse or things like that. Like I would just like either write down their names or just pay attention to them and say, oh, I like how they, I like how they present themselves in the courtroom. Or it's really interesting that this particular person is a judge and I want to know their journey. And I would just reach out to them um, via LinkedIn or I would ask around for their contacts. Um, and then I also got involved with the African-American Doctrinal Studies program on the main campus at the U, which broadened my horizons um, beyond the law school. And then the third thing is um, for me as well, and as a minority, I think it's key, is to make sure you have a group outside, not just of like your firm, but for me, outside of the profession of law. Um, because sometimes like legal work can be a lot and I don't always want to talk about cases all the time with all of my friends and um, or about the law or I, sometimes that can get a little taxing for me on my mind. Um, but I found a group of friends, young black professional group. And um, from there, I'm like, I actually get cases um, and I get referrals from that group more so than my other attorney friends because they're 
taking those clients, but, or, you know, they're, they take, they have their own clientele that they maintain. So I get referrals a lot from that. And that's just my long way. I know I'm long winded. So <laughs> that's my way of saying how I got involved as a student. And that trickled into like my connections and my network as a, as a first year attorney, because I don't have to, you know, walk around behind my partners or my shareholders like I'm lost all the time or anything like that I can pick up the phone and text Sade or you know um, text or email someone that I you know see that they're you know dealing with in their own practice and I can say hey how do you handle this situation and um, and I'm able to kind of just navigate that way um, so I think um, kind of piggybacking off of Sade too is just saying like building your connection and as a student is 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 a building block is a strong building block to building your network as an attorney here. Yeah, I love that. I think that's a good point to to end on for that piece because I I always tell students too like your your um, professional network starts even in your undergrad and in law school and you can't ignore those connections or, or relationships because they, they will end up being really important. So I appreciate all of that. Um, I also love the story that they thought it was a different person at your law school that was the- <laughs> It was hilarious. I was like, I don't even know. It, it, it's kind of funny because it's one of those things where, you know, when you're the only African-American, it's like, people just know you. Yeah. And, um, and it, it, it builds on key to about building your professional represent, uh, rep uh, reputation as well, because people just know you because it's like, oh, you're talking about that one African American girl that transferred. And that's, and it wasn't to like offend me, but like people that's just how people knew me because I mean, hey, <laughs> but yeah, that was kind of funny. <laughs> I love it because I have been mistaken for being black. I have to tell people I am not black and this, yeah, I've been in the other person's position, right? Like you're, you're talking about so-and-so, but that's not, <laughs> so I appreciate that story a lot. Yeah. Um, on that note though, of, of maybe being the only black student, I think an issue often comes up for for women of color and maybe particularly black women that um, you do get asked to do a lot or to, represent in a lot of ways. Um, so how do you each go about, um, or, or what advice would you give to law students or, or new lawyers who want to be involved and get involved, but also maintain balance and, and personal well-being? How do you go about making those decisions for yourself? Maybe Shade, we can start with you. Sure. So, um, I mean, this is something that I am always having to constantly go back and rebalance and recalibrate because we want to say yes, right? When you get asked to do something, you want to say yes, but practically speaking, you, if you say yes to everything, you're saying no to everything, right? Because you're not going to be able to actually participate, be present, um, contribute in the way that you want. So what I have done is I've stepped back from things that I was asked to do, but I wasn't necessarily very excited about or as excited about and then decided to only say yes to things that fit within what I was passionate about, which is diversity and inclusion. And so um, I am involved in various organizations um, to promote that, including my own law firm, you know, UCLE, um, the Family Law Executive Committee uh, with the State Bar, um, but that's what my role is. And so that's when I'm just focusing on that and not other things like technology or socials or what all these other things that I've done before, it makes it so it's a lot easier to scale because when I'm doing something for one, it's almost as though I'm doing something for the others as well. So that's that's what I decided to do. I mean, especially with um, this last year with the pandemic and things being so chaotic anyway and having a son and my family life that I need to balance and then also my health and you know well-being. Um, for me, that's what works well. That's a great guideline. Um, Amber, do you have anything to add? Uh, I agree with Shade 100%. Like understanding, having a focus, I think helps you understand what you can say yes or no to, or maybe. 
um, and setting your goals. Um, that doesn't necessarily come with just being the only minority student um, in any or only minority in any situation. It just comes with being great or good at what you do as well. And so people will see you and think, oh, like I, I really like the fact that she's a hard worker or he's able to write these amazing, you know, um, these ama amazing motions. So I just want, I want this person to write all of my motions from now on or whatever the case is. And so when I was in law school in Texas, I ran into that problem where it was, you know, a lot of my professors saw me as a standout student. And I mean, that's not like, I'm not trying to not be modest about that. I'm just saying that it came with the, you know, hey, I want you to do this. I want you to do this. I want you to do this. And I felt like I couldn't say no because I was a 1L student and I was just like, I can't say no. Like what? I'm going to tell these professors who have, you know, all this tenured and everything else know that I can't, I don't have time. Like I'm sure they have, they don't have time. And, um, and, and I wasn't the only African-American student in that capacity. I wasn't the only one. I, it was just the fact that, you know, there was, qualities about my work products that people felt that they wanted to have me a part of. And um, so I had to learn then that I needed to set a focus. Like I just needed to say like, okay, I'm very passionate about these things. And so if I get asked to do these things, of course I'm gonna say yes, but anything else, either it's gonna be a maybe or I don't have the capacity or time to do that. Um, and so it just helped me to kind of focus um, and understand the things that I'm passionate about. Like Shade said, diversity. Um, so when I got asked to do BALSA, of course, like I, there's not a BALSA, there wasn't a BALSA chapter at the University of Utah. And I, I felt like it was a, a great opportunity. And so I, I wanted to do it. But a lot of other things I was asked at the U to do, I I decided to decline on. So, um, and that goes forth in me being a, a first year associate as well. Um, understanding my focus, understanding the partners I'm working for, understanding my caseloads, understanding my, my, my capacity, and then being able to say, yes, I, I can certainly do this today or tomorrow, or I don't have the capacity today, but can I get back to you on Monday? Um, just understanding those things will help you um, to, to, have a clear understanding. I have a, a quick thing to add on that. So it, it is hard to say no, especially when you're in law school um, to professors or somebody asks you to do something. But, you know, so first thing is sleep on it. Sleep on it for at least one night before you say yes, no, or maybe. Just say, hey, I, you know, can I have some time to think about it? I really want to think this through. I'm so appreciative of you approaching me with this opportunity. The second thing is, is if it's something that needs to go into the no bin because it's not in that lane of what your focus is. Um, a good way to approach it is, of course, with expressing your gratitude for being asked and that you're flattered, but that, um, you know, it's, it's not a fit for you because you're focusing on these other things. And then even um, suggesting somebody else that you know of who you think would be good, because that's another way to build your network within your peer group. Right. Because when you are standout, people will ask you to do things. And then um, there are so many other people that aren't being asked at the same time. But if you know people on a different level and you're helping to elevate them, that I mean, it's obviously going to pay dividends in multiple ways. And it's just the right thing to do. Um, I think you just answered actually the question that was raised in the Q&A. Oh, I did? Yeah. <laughs> how, do, how do you say no in the right way? And yeah, I think because it's hard right on because and I do think it takes practice because most of us are inclined to to try and do things that don't necessarily add to to the, the passions that we have or the capacity that we have really right so um, Amber do you have anything else on that question though any specifics that you keep in mind in in how you go about saying no to something I think you've hit on it a little bit already but if you have anything you'd like to add I'll Give you a chance. No, Melinda, I am very grateful that you asked me that question. No, I'm kidding. No, I really don't. I really don't have anything to add because Shade actually put, like she said exactly like the same exact advice that I got early on um, in law school and in my career. Um, the only thing I would add, add is if you are unsure, you just don't feel comfortable with saying no, or you don't know how to do it, even with the advice that you like Shade just gave, 
make sure you have a good mentor or somebody you could go to that you can say, hey, can I run either this email message by you or you know my whole spill that I wanna say to either this partner or this judge or this professor, or whatever the case is, like, can I run this by you real quick and let just, Give me your feedback as to how it comes across because sometimes, you know, emails, your tone can come across a certain way, you don't realize it. Or even when you're speaking, your tone can come across a certain way and you don't realize it. So um, just run those things by people. Um, and if you, you know, when you're trying that out the first couple of times as well, um, but even as you get, um, go through your career and everything like I have partners I've been working with them for almost three years and I can't I don't feel comfortable saying no all the time um, I just like the moment they ask I just if like okay I will just stay up until 1 a.m and figure this out but um but in that in those limited capacities like I still have people I will go to or I will talk to you about you know hey does this sound okay? Would you accept this? No. And, you know, they'll give me their feedback. Um, I do want to highlight that it is difficult as a young attorney, a law student, there's power, there's definite power dynamics at play, right? And it's, it can be really hard to say no um, in the right way. And so I, I appreciate that, that advice to seek out a mentor's input um because i did make the mistake as a young attorney of not saying no in, in one particular situation that i can think of and the partner took me aside and i think it was probably because i didn't do as well as i normally did on the assignment and she said you know you should say no if you can't do everything to the full extent you know and she did it in the nicest possible way and i really appreciated it but i also took that to heart because she had to say that to me right and so it, it meant a lot um, so, um, let's, let's talk, I mean, we're, we're here talking about, you know, avoiding burnout and making sure we have that right balance. So do, do either of you have like specific practices that you implement in your life to create that balance between engaging with your work and maintaining personal well-being? So, I mean, beyond just making sure your workload is okay, like making sure that you are personally okay. What types of practices do you both implement? Um, maybe let's start with Amber this time. Um, I don't, I'm still learning um, how to balance that. Um, I just learned that your first year is just a whole learning curve and you're gonna learn a lot, even though you think you know a lot and you really don't. Um, and your partners will be quick to let you know that you are, you know, you don't know anything. Um, but I, I, I am still learning. Um, I will say, um, I just received my license in October. And so November, it was, I had to hit the ground running with my hours. And by December, January, or yeah, by December, I was like, I'm overwhelmed and I don't know how to balance anything. Um, so I will say that Sade taking me under her wing and being, you know, my mentor and us going, and we go out to eat like now, what is it once a month now? Mm -hmm. um, and we kind of like have regular conversations um, here and there. And um, that helps me to kind of break out um, somewhat of like a work that helps start me to break out somewhat of a work-life balance and understanding what um, a life of an attorney really is. And it's not necessarily always work, 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 but um, you can have engaging conversations with other attorneys um, as well outside of work and kind of just take away, like get away from the computer a little bit. Um, but what I guess my number one advice would be make sure you have a good calendar system at least going start that now understand how you know you understand your own patterns and habits um and when you, because when you become an attorney there's going to be um a lot of things coming at you but being organized in your calendar is just a way to make that to be a game changer um and understanding how to balance that um, so I would suggest doing it now. Um, if you're an undergrad student, I wish I had understood calendaring and everything else when I was in undergrad. So if you know somebody who is really great at calendaring, 
ask them if you could like check out their calendar or their planners or however the case is and um, kind of shadow them and do that. Um, so that's just my major, one major suggestion is one, have a good mentor, two, um, calendar, learn how to calendar. Both really, really good suggestions. Um, Sade, what do you have to add? Um, I'll echo the calendar. So I have this thing, it's called the monk manual. <laughs> Yep. And it's like part planner, part diary, but um, it has monthly, weekly, and daily where you write in it. And so on Sunday night, part of what I do is I'll sit down and re-review everything that I have to do for that week. And then I'll write it out again, but then it helps me to be able to check off whether or not I'm staying on track. Um, also, I just sleep. Hygiene is a huge deal. Um, I am not always the best at it. I can't always be the best at it, but it's good for me to get seven hours of sleep because then the hours when I'm awake, I'm more productive. I'm able to exercise. Um, I think getting, you know, out and whether it's a brisk walk or it's lifting weights or it's, you know, running, but just 30 minutes a day at a minimum is something that everybody should be doing for a lot of different reasons. Um, so those are, those are kind of the things that are big for me. I mean, I get up early. I'm up usually at 5.30 every morning at the latest, and that helps me to be able to accomplish everything that I need to get done through the day. Um, your, your life sounds very similar to mine as I'm sitting here next to my, my planner. <laughs> yeah. my is right next to me in yep. tandem with my Google calendar. So it's yep. like always together. Um, <laughs> Well, you feel accomplished too. And you're like, oh, I did all these things, you know, like you get to actually look through and it, there's a part where it, you express gratitude, the things that were the highlights of the day. So you do a recap as well and what you can do better for the next day. Right. And I do cool. think there's some, some value and power in writing it all out. So it, it feels like you can have a grasp on it. Cause sometimes if you just mull it over in your head, it, it feels overwhelming and at least Absolutely. for me, when I write it out, it's like, okay, I can manage this a little bit easier. Yeah. And to add for me, like all of my calendars are, are digital. Like I used to be, when I first started law school, I used to have my cat, like I used to write things out on my calendar, but I'm just not that person for some reason. I don't know why my calendar just felt like it was another book to me in law school. <laughs> and um, that's just me. And for all of you guys out there who are watching this, you might, you know, you, if you relate to writing and having things out in a book, then certainly do that. If you're more of a visual person like me, it like pleases my mind to see my Google calendar in these colors and <laughs> full and engaging and knowing that, okay, like, you know, when I get up, I get up similar as I don't get up later than five o'clock. So at five o'clock, I'm like looking, I'm like, man, I'm going to go running at 5.30. I'm so excited about that. And I can see it like it's like in, like I have everything color coded and it's like, I don't know, something about that Google calendar being color coded and like full makes me happy. And I um, merged it with my Outlook calendar at work. So it just like looks amazing to me. <laughs> it pleases my mind and um, and it helps me to stay organized because I am a very more visual person. And then if it's just like flat, I kind of overlook it or think, oh, you know, I probably completed something that I don't. It, it, and I had to learn that. I, I went through several different kind of calendars. So yeah, that's okay. me. I think that's important too. And to, to know it can evolve and change. You don't have to use the same system that you've always used if it's not working for you in that moment or that time of your life. So um, I love, I love that. And I'm, I love that I'm not the only person that like gets excited about their calendar. <laughs> that and tabs, like I love tabulation, like, oh my gosh. And this is my court <laughs> rules. Like I was irritated because these were the only tabs we had in the office. So I put them in and I was like, you know what? I'm getting new ones on Monday. <laughs> because I'm obsessed with tabs and they have to look a certain way, but I just love like, oh, I don't know. Uh, you and I need to be better friends. I have a whole tab system as well and color coding and my highlighting and all of those things. So, yes. Yes. Um, so maybe actually this is a, a question that I get a lot from students and it hasn't necessarily come up here, but I, I think it's important to share. Um, 
I get a lot of people asking me, you know, if I'm not that early morning person or the, you know, um, intense organized person, is there a place for me in, in the law? And maybe you can, because I think we can give off the sense that all lawyers are one particular type of person or personality. Um, maybe can you guys speak to that? And, and maybe let's start with Sade since you've been practicing for longer. Yeah, so um, I don't know if, if you've, people that are on the call, if you've heard of something called a sleep chronotype, um, but Google that and take the test because um, basically there's, there's four chronotypes in terms of when your brain and body are working the best. And most people fall into the category of kind of uh, what I describe myself as, but um, there's a large segment of the population that when they get up in the morning, the morning to them is like 10 a.m. And then they're up and their brain is feeling awesome at midnight and they don't sleep until like three or four. And that's just the way that your body and your biochemistry is. But that, and there is a place for you, but it's something to figure out so that that way you can arrange your calendar and schedule so that it's optimized to your body and how your performance is going to be best. Um, so sleep chronotype. Mm. That's interesting. I love that. Uh, there's also a lot of books about how our, our world is often made for morning risers and that's also not true of everyone, right? And so... Well, and that's why, because most people, about 50% of the population falls into that. The morning riser needs about seven hours of sleep, functions the best from about 10 to two, and then kind of has an afternoon lull, and then can do a couple more things before going home and doing it. Like, that, that's why the world is made for us. But there is a place for people that don't fall into that. Um, Amber, what do you think? Have you seen um, success for those who may not be the, the calendar lovers, the tab lovers. Yes, because I was one of those people. <laughs> so I, I really was. And then I don't know what happened. No, I honestly, I've never taken a sleep chronic, chronotype test. However, I um, just had to learn part of being, I think in any profession, whether you're an attorney or not, um, is knowing your own habits like what are your own you know what are your natural habits as a human being and what are you comfortable with because if you're not comfortable with yourself like just being as a person then it's going to transfer into your your work or into your personal life that's just in general I mean there's thousands of books about that right um but I, um, so for me, and even tra like transitioning out of law school into being an attorney, I had to learn that, um, yeah, I, I do like, I like to sleep. Um, <laughs> my first year, I did struggle. I will admit, I did struggle getting to my 830 class my first year. I, I, I struggled that first semester. But also, I'm a very intense, part. like, I also like correcting my mistakes. So I work at things until I get it right. And eventually I was on task for that. But, um, but I've, I had to learn that, yeah, at, I kind of have this sluggish moment in the mornings and I don't necessarily, my brain doesn't click on immediately at five o'clock when I wake up or even when I'm running. So I'm like, I decided to start getting up at like 4.45, five o'clock because I know that if I could start getting up earlier um, in the morning and kind of getting my exercise in before I go to work, then, you know, I take an hour out of that. By that time, it's six o'clock. Sometimes I can even get started on some of my projects that I know by like eight o'clock, I'm going to have like a coffee moment and my brain is probably going to like fizz out a little bit. I can get started on those projects like right after I come back from the gym sometimes and then kind of rest in between that time and when I have to be back at work and then kind of get back into the groove of going to work. And sometimes by, you know, the end of the day, I kind of like completed most of my task and I can probably get started on the task for tomorrow. Now, am I always like that? No, um, but it has helped make, like I've been a little, I've been a lot more structured um, doing that and understanding that, you know, this is, this is just how I am. I know that I can't take on 
Um, not that I'd say no to meetings or anything like that, but if I have to conduct a meeting, I'm like, I know that I won't be as, you know, so I'm going to make sure that I have more things scheduled in certain times and doing things blocked out in certain areas to make sure that that's, that I'm maximizing my potential in every situation. So take the test, like Sade said, I, it probably would have helped me early on, um, but I just had to learn the hard way from experience. Mm -hmm. I, I'm the same. I had to figure it, like kind of take notes of what was happening to me. And I noted, you know, 2 p.m. like clockwork, I'm not that functional. So maybe that's the time for my emails or for a break, you know, and to come mm -hmm. back. So um, yeah, thank you for that. I think both of those are really like concrete things that could be applied and, and helpful for anyone. Um, well, we have about seven minutes left, so I do want to leave time for, for more questions from the participants if, if there are any. Um, I do have a, additional com or questions of my own, but um, if anyone in the audience has, has some questions, please feel free. Um, uh, I'll just keep asking and you can um, go ahead and type them in the chat or in the, in the Q&A, but um, Maybe let's let's start with this one while while the questions are coming. Um, do you have any um, advice you would give to, um, or is there anything you wish you'd known as a law student that you could share with with current and future students? Because many of the people on this call are future law students. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I think that this is a, it's an important thing to keep in mind. Keep control over your student loan debt mm -hmm. because. So I, I was super cheap in law school. I mean, I'm kind of, <laughs> I'm more fiscally austere, although I'll buy things that are kind of outrageous from time to time. But, you know, things like I would ask my neighbors, hey, can I share your Wi-Fi and pay for part of it? Just anything I could do to cut any little corner, because living high on the hog for those three years it, it's not going to be important going forward. It's really not. I mean, during that time, you're there to learn, you're there to go to school. It's, it's not particularly glamorous, but being sidled with a bunch of debt, that is more than what you're going to be able to earn in your first year when you come out. That's a good rule of thumb that it's too much. So um, I looked at it and I was conservative about it in terms of, well, you know, I mean, I'll probably be able to make like 65 or 70,000. So I need to keep my debt at that. And it, it's paid off, right? Because I haven't had to deal with that for so long. And then I was able to make more and right, like, but um, you know, that's something that people get sidled with and you hear about that. And obviously that's a big thing too in politics right now, but um, people coming out of school with, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt that they just, they don't really have, they're not going to have an opportunity to pay that off. That's, that's great advice. Very practical. Um, Amber, um, anything else that you, you wish you had known, you had known? Uh, I agree with Sade on that one. <laughs> I'm a hundred thousand over a hundred thousand dollars in debt, but I, like I said, my decision to come to Salt Lake City was a financial decision. And if I didn't make that decision, I would have been more in debt. Um, so definitely keep that in mind when you're making your decisions as well. Um, is, is the school going to offer you a scholarship? The University of Utah definitely offered me a scholarship. And so that played into my, my decision making too. Um, but for me, my advice would be, um, in addition to finances, understand, um, if you're considering law school, understand the social dynamics of the law school understand what it is that you, um, once again, it goes back to understanding you and knowing what you're comfortable with. So when I say social dynamics, um, are you gonna be comfortable being um, the only African-American in your law school class or one of three? Do you want a more diverse um, experience? Um, and also, like I said, researching the bars of the state, like, do you want to be in a bigger bar like Texas or California where you're gonna be one of many and breaking into what you wanna do is a little harder, a little more difficult than a place like Utah. Um, and, and just being very cognitive of the fact that like, there's, a, there's also a social component that goes to it as well. And um, for me, even making a decision to University of Utah, I wish someone would have told me that as well, because it took me a lot longer to understand 
my like being comfortable socially, um, which hindered me too, because being able to interact with your classmates um, is, is important because you start to learn like, oh, um, this person may have a, a outline or something, or they outline a very particular way that I want to like figure out what's going on there. Or, um, you know, just different things you start learning that your social life is very important in law school. Um, regardless of contrary to popular belief, we're not always super competitive and down each other's throat. Um, law school, the, those people are gonna be your family. So um, research a law school, make sure it's something you're comfortable with, not just because it is cool or it's popular, or that's where you know your favorite person goes. Um, just keep that in mind. That's one thing I wish I would have known. Okay, that's, that's helpful and it does um, address a question that we have in, in the Q&A from an anonymous. Um, maybe this relates to that, but what else influenced your decision on where to go to law school? Um, Shadi, do you wanna address that? Yeah, so um, what influenced my decision is I wanted to stay out West being from the West and I wanted a community that wasn't, that kind of fit the profile of what I wanted, you know, the collegiality of the Utah bar. I didn't want to stay out West and go to California <laughs> where um, things are pretty acrimonious because people figure, hey, I'm never going to see this person again unless you're in some small town. I wanted a place where people knew each other and could form relationships um, even across um, lines, you know, plaintiffs and versus defendants. I wanted it to be that way. Um, I also wanted a city that was livable and it's in terms of being able to commute, in terms of being able to find a place to rent. Um, so it, that came down to finances as well. And then the scholarship piece, um, the U, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's such a great school. Um, and it's surprising to me that you were the only, I didn't realize until this call, Amber, that you were the only African-American student still. Like that's surprising to me because I went there um, from 2003 to 2006 and that was me, but that was also, you know, 17 years ago. And so the fact that that's still a struggle, I, what I would say is um, I'm okay with not being comfortable. Um, I'm okay with making my own way. And so if you're somebody who you're okay with having a situation where maybe you do feel uh, like you are the only one, and, but you're okay to move forward with that, there's a place for you. Um, so just because there are other people that look like you are from the same background doesn't mean that you're not going to be welcome, certainly with respect to Utah. And that's been the case, not just in law school, but at my firms that I've been at and at all of the different organizations and groups I've been involved in, there's always been a place for me. I've just had to express my interest in being involved. That's great advice. I love that. Um, we are out of time, but we normally wrap up with just a 30 second to a minute, like parting words from each of our panelists, specifically to students who may not have, been, may not be decided about whether they're going to law school. Um, so what, what would you say to someone who's considering law school um, and a legal career and is on the fence at this point um, in 30 seconds to a minute? Uh, let's start with Amber and then we'll wrap up with Shadi. I know that's a lot to ask in the time. But. <laughs> I'm is. glad you're going first because I heard that question. I <laughs> okay, I would say, you know, definitely I, I would go. I was a person who was on the fence and eventually I ended up going. Um, there, the legal field is one of those fields where it, there's a place, like Shadi said, there's a place for everyone in any particular type of way, in any particular part of this, country or where you are in life, whatever the case is, go, you have a place in the field, do it. It's fun. We are litigators, so our lives are different, but there's also in-house counsel. You can be Barack Obama, you can do whatever you want in this field. So it's kind of up to you and you can make it um, whatever you want to make it. And it, that's, that's just my advice. I would, I don't regret the decision to go to law school. So I'm sure if you're on the fence and you decide to go, you won't regret it either. Love that. Okay, go ahead, Shadi. I don't know that I can top that answer. And, and what I would say is um, I'm just really supportive of historically underrepresented people going to graduate school. So if maybe you're thinking about law school versus going and getting your master's in whatever, like do it, you know, research it figure out why you're on the fence. Why is it that you're on the fence about law school? Is it cost? 
Is it because you don't feel like you're interested in it? Is it because you don't like to read? You like hard science, whatever it is, figure out why, why you're on the fence. And then that'll help dictate your choice in terms of what professional school or graduate degree you pursue. Because just because you, I think law school is a great choice. I agree with Amber, but um, I, it's not for everyone. And if it's not, then just figure out why it's not. Don't just sit on the fence forever though and never make a move. Like you got to make a move and not be on the fence. That's what you'll regret in life. With everything in life, like make a decision, just do right. it. Yep. Yep. And you'll find out if it's right or wrong and that's okay too, either way. Right. Um, so thank you. Those are great parting words. Um, I want to thank Amber and Sade again for being with us. It's really great to talk to you always, um, but to ha share insights in this forum is really wonderful. I do want to note Sade is the um, co-chair over our education committee at Euclid, and so she's intimately involved in our mentoring program in particular, and we have a lot of great resources available to students and hope that you'll take advantage of those resources. Um, including these webinars, which happen every other Wednesday. In March, we're going to be focusing on women lawyers because it's um, Women's History Month. And so we'll be hearing from some female judges and female attorneys um, on, on similar topics and on, on what they do in the law. So we hope you'll, you'll stay with us and join us again. And again, thank you, Amber and Shade. Um, we yeah. love of course. So the last thing I, I'll just say is um, if anybody on the call wants to contact me for more information, yeah, please email me. It can be found on my firm website. It's just sturner at strongandhandy.com. Thank you for that. Awesome. Okay. Well, take care, everyone. Yep. Thank you. Bye. Bye.